Welcome to SAT Virtual Boot Camp session number four. Today we're going to be going over math uh, strategies as well as writing and language strategies, and we will touch briefly upon the essay, um, but we won't spend a lot of time there because, of course, May is the last time the essay will be given. So I'm only going over it in case some of you signed up for it so that you know how to tackle it, but otherwise, not important for anyone else to know. So uh, as always, I like to just remind you of what the testing structure looks like. Yesterday, we <laughs> tackled the first section. Today, we're basically working on all the rest of them. Um, so the math, as you know, is divided into two sections, uh, section three and four, calculator and no calculator section. And uh, that is the topic that we will be working on first. So there is always 58 questions total. And if you saw the grid that I just put up and you were like, what's an MC or a GI? I was just abbreviating that for multiple choice versus grid ins. So there's always the exact same number on every test. And, it, and as you can see back on this slide, that you will have 15 multiple choice and five grid ins on your no calculator section. And that will be 30 multiple choice and eight grid ins on your calculator section. So that's the breakdown of those. Your without calculator section will always be 25 minutes and uh, have 20 questions, about 1.25 minutes per question, a minute and a quarter. And with calculator section is always going to be 55 minutes, 38 questions, or close to a minute and a half per question. Now, of course, um, nobody's a robot who's spending exactly the same amount of time on each question, right? On a question that's easier for you to answer, you might spend far less than this on a, giving you more time on the higher difficulty questions to perhaps spend a little more. This is an average. This can help you when you're pacing and as you're practicing, you can see how much time you're taking question per question and see if your pace is appropriate and it, you can start to see if you can feel you're spending too much time on questions. Why is that and how can you uh, become more efficient with your time? <laughs> Yes, Chris is, uh, he doesn't just like playing golf, he's on the golf team for Kent State. So I always um, show you different Canadian students who uh, either I've worked with or who we've featured on our Instagram channel before. Uh, so you will always at the beginning of the math section have the exact same instructions. So it's a really good idea to become familiar with the instructions so that you're not spending time reading them. They are standardized, exactly the same test to test. So on section three, you will be told that a calculator is not permitted and on section four that it is permitted. That is going to be the one big difference. Other than that, all the other notes are going to look exactly the same, talking about um, just parameters and things you can expect from the test. I think the most important one here is that figures are drawn to scale unless otherwise indicated, which is great because if you see a triangle, it's a triangle. If you see um, a square, you know, it's a square. So they, they're they doing a good job of, of giving you that information and that's going to help you make some assumptions in order to, in order to solve problems. Also, uh, there's a reference section where they let you know about various geometric shapes and and um, formulas in case you maybe took geometry a while ago and you've forgotten some of these. I think particularly the special right triangles are really good to know. I love a special right triangle. Typically knowing this information or even if you forgot it, knowing that it's there and available for you to glance at can help you save quite a bit of time on the SAT because instead of um, you know using the Pythagorean theorem to solve, you can use uh, the knowledge of your special triangles. So the subscores, as somebody asked questions about that yesterday, I realized I should be a little bit more specific. Um, subscores are on your score report. So after you take your test, you can see you will have um, the total score out of 1600 on this sample score report. It's a person who scored in the 50th percentile, right? So they, they are, got, um, somewhere around half the questions right. 
depending. And um, so in the math section, you can see they got a 520 scaled score. And as you scroll down the page, you can see the subscores. And the subscores make up uh, both verbal topics and math topics. So the last three topics in the subscores are your, um, the, three, the three last subscores are your math subscores. And those are heart of algebra, problem solving and data analysis, and passport to advanced math. The subscores will represent the full 58 points of the math section. And it will always be divvied up in this exact same way. You can consider heart of algebra. Um, basically, in the US, it would be like your grade nine algebra. So um, a lot of those concepts will be concepts that you've learned as building blocks in algebra. So maybe you learn them in grade eight, nine, 10, respectively, depending on, you know, depending on your system of math at your school. And then the passport to advanced math, on the other hand, is when you're going to start encountering, encountering more um, what would be called algebra two or trig or also trigonometry. So you might encounter things like uh, f um, uh, functions and so grade 11 math, as well as some basic trigonometry concepts. When it comes to trig, you're really only going to encounter sine, cosine, tangent, and like imaginary numbers. Those are really the two things that come up for trig. So even if you haven't learned trig, you can use the Khan Academy to just learn about those topics um, and work with a friend who's familiar with them to get comfortable and then maybe be able to feel comfortable to test on them. So the good news is you don't need to know all of trigonometry. Trigonometry, you basically need two concepts. Um, and then of course, problem solving and data analysis. So those 17 points will always be in the with calculator section. So that means like about half of the with calculator section is, um, is related to, to these data analysis. So those are gonna be your charts, your graphs, or what we've called previously infographics, right? So um, they will also use that word infographic to describe um, any um, kind of picture or uh, data set that you're looking at. And I love that under this one. So this this breakout information is what I got. I grabbed off the College Board website. <laughs> I love solving problems is um, <laughs> very nonspecific uh, subcategory of problem solving and data analysis. So, you know, do with that information what you will. Uh, yes, the sessions being recorded. I always record the sessions and you do receive the recordings afterwards. So I'm just going to show you a few samples of, you know, different kinds of questions that would fall in these various categories. So this first one, you can see it's a number one. In the math section, typically um, it, it goes up in level of difficulty. So the first few questions are usually fairly low difficulty questions, and you will encounter more heart of algebra questions up front. And then it typically progresses in difficulty through the multiple choice section. Then when you get to the grid ends, the level of difficulty is going to go back to kind of low to high again. That's fairly typical of the math section. The verbal can bounce around a little bit. It's not, it's not in level of difficulty, but math tends to be. So, um, so what that means is, if the first few questions feel quick, feel a bit easy to you, that's okay. They're supposed to. Um, so as you can see, this is a, a pretty standard um, algebra kind of solve for K situation, or sorry, solve for X. <laughs> Plug in the value of K and then solve for X. Um, I'm just going to kind of fly through these because you've already done them before. If you want to on a piece of pencil, a piece of paper with a pencil, um, you should have that with you. If you want to solve for these as we're going along, go for it. Um, but as I mentioned before, have your practice test open and be looking at the work that you did and how you responded. Um, so most of you should be just looking at the work that you already accomplished on, on these problems. Um, and then just like yesterday, we'll pull some from uh, practice test 10 for practice. So hopefully you didn't do those yesterday. I told you not to. Um, okay, so for number one, the the answer here is is 10. Hopefully that's one that the majority of you um, 
you got right. If you didn't, um, really just look into brushing up on your algebra. This is, you know, this is the building blocks of most of what you'll encounter on the SAT. So, so um, solving for variables is a very important uh, building block concept. Solving problem in data analysis. So here's a good example of, of the kind of sample question you'll encounter. You can see there's a table and typically what's going to happen is first glance over the table. Um, you can kind of get a sense of what this is about, length of fish in inches. There's a bunch of numbers, okay, so fish lengths. Um, we don't know why we're looking at this, but that's, we get down to the description, right? And um, I think word problems can be intimidating sometimes because it's a lot, it's a lot to deal with. You're looking at a significant amount of numbers, then you're looking at a significant amount of words. And I think that can feel a little overwhelming. But just remember that in that little description area, a lot of that is going to be just describing what the table is so that you can wrap your head around it and is not going to be in the information you need to solve the problem. So um, as we read it, so I'll, I'll go ahead and read this question. The table above lists the lengths to the nearest inch of random sample of 21 brown bullhead fish. So like the fact that it's brown bullhead fish, who cares? Oftentimes there's like irrelevant data that's like way more than you need to know. So any descriptors in a math problem are usually like completely not important unless there was two tables where it was comparing brown bullhead fish to rainbow trout then we need to keep keep that information separate right but we're looking at one table one kind of fish so who cares what kind it is what matters is there's 21 of them and we know the measurement is inches right so those are the things that are most important the outlier measurement of 24 inches is an error. So whenever you read information like that, the first thing, did anybody, the first thing they did when you read that sentence, go and cross off the number 24 or circle it or something that's gonna show you that like, this is a this this is significant to this problem, right? So just like on reading comprehension, there's a bit of kind of writing as you, as you read. And we're gonna talk a little more about that in a minute. Of the mean, median, and range of the values listed, which will change the most if the 24 inch measurement is removed from the data set? So, okay, if you had crossed it off, that's exactly what it asked you to do. Now you've got 20 fish with different measurements. So, basically, what this question is asking you is to understand the definitions of mean, median, and range. If you don't clearly understand the definitions of those things, you might not get this question right. So, the SAT does that a lot, where they're basically just saying, we're testing you for understanding of these math concepts. So if you're not comfortable with these, that's definitely something you would like to, that you should practice. I'm going to go ahead and put up a poll and see how people answered this question. And as you're doing that, I'm just going to remind you that we're going over strategies today. So um, I'm not going to do a lot of like teaching math concepts. That's what the Khan Academy is for. So if you're not familiar with mean, median, and range, I'm not going to go over them. Um, you need to go to the Khan Academy and watch videos on them and get more comfortable. Rather, I'm going, I'm just talking about what to expect on the test and then different strategies you can employ for different kinds of problems. So just want to make that clear. If math is not your strong suit, you definitely want to do a, a bit of work in that field and maybe, um, you know, take more math courses or engage with some sort of math tutoring, even if, even with a peer who can help you. All right, let's take a look at the poll. All right, good job. Most of you got this one right. Um, and again, take a look at the answer, um, the answer booklet, the handout. Uh, and I can re-put that in the chat in the handout section for you. I'll do that right now just to make sure you have it. So the practice test one answer sheet. So you can use that answer sheet document if you don't understand um, why range is the correct answer. You can read up on that and maybe just make a little mark for yourself as something uh, for you to study more. 
Question number eight is a good example of a passport to advanced math. So again, you're being asked to understand the definition of something. So if you know what absolute value is, then this should be a pretty straightforward question. If you don't remember or you haven't learned it yet, then this may be a more difficult question, okay? So um, we'll go ahead and restart the poll for you so you can show what you got for this one. And I'm going to go ahead and guess that the younger students might have a harder time with this one and the students in grade 11 or people who have done advanced math are going to have an easier time with it. Yeah, so the folks that are 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 choosing A, for example, are those who have probably not learned absolute value yet. So the answer to this one is D. Um, there is no such value as N. So again, use the answer booklet I've put in the handouts just to learn more about absolute value or make a note to uh, study up on that concept if that's not something you've got if that you're familiar with. So let's transition into the tips and strategies that we're going to use, and then we're going to practice them. <laughs> so first and foremost, use your pencil. It's very, very important to be marking up your booklet as you go. As we talked about before, you can write anywhere you want in your booklet, all over the figures and, you know, wherever. So make sure if there are figures, you're marking them up with the information you've received, you're writing down your work, but you don't need to show your steps as you would in, so like in a lot of high school math classes, your teacher takes off points, like if you don't show all your steps in the way that they expect you to do it. So, you know, you don't have to do that, but you should write down your work as you're going so that you are not doing just mental math. You're more likely to make errors if you try to keep everything going in just your brain. Remember, math is at the end of the test and you're going to start to get a bit tired. You need to be able to easily check your work, so writing it down is the best way to do it. You're going to signpost word problems kind of in a similar way as you, well, it's, it's, a diff, it's a bit of a different method, but like similar to how we were doing that in reading comprehension, we're going to use our pencil as we're working through math problems when we have a bit more of a paragraph that we're looking at. So um, you're going to underline the important info for solving the problem, and you're going to put a box around the solution. And by the solution, I mean in the question itself, the bit of information that tells you exactly what you're solving for. So, you know, um, in the previous problem about uh, bullhead trout, the you were solving for what was the thing that was changing the most, right? Like that's the thing that you would put the box around. Bullhead trout, we don't underline that. We don't put a box around it. It's not relevant information to solving the problem, okay? So this can help you stay on task and also it's gonna help you engage with your reading a little bit more. Marking up figures, I mean just like writing on them. So, whether you're given a length of something, write that down. If you're told a line is drawn through it, draw a line through it. So just using your pencil to include whatever information you need on the figure to solve the problem, which is something a lot of you probably already do. But maybe, you know, on the test you took Monday, if you weren't able to uh, mark the test itself because it was on your computer, you maybe didn't get a chance to practice that. So I'm hoping for tomorrow you have a way to write on a test, whether you've bought a book and you can you can mark up a test in a book. You can, you can go out to chapters and get one today if you want to. Um, you can overnight it from Amazon. Um, you can uh, pr print out a test. You can... Um, you know, find out uh, maybe an app. If you have a tablet, maybe you have an app and a stylus you can use to mark on on a tablet. So I really, you know, do your best to find a way to be able to practice marking up your test tomorrow. Um, and should we bubble in our answers as we go at the end? 
Great question, Andre. Um, so I highly recommend that you bubble them as you go. Couple of reasons. Number one, if you accidentally run out of time, your whole answer sheet will be blank. And that would be pretty bad. Um, you know, you never know what kind of proctor you're going to have. You you never know where the clock in the room is going to be. And so to be best con in control, bubbling as you go, make sure that you won't have a problem with getting your answers in. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is if you wait to the end and you accidentally, like you skipped a question or something along the way and you're bubbling in, it's going to throw off all your answer choices. So what's best to do is to just make sure every time you're bubbling, like I'm on number four, bubble number four, five, five. And then at the end, go through and double check you did everything right. So hopefully at the end, you have time to double check as opposed to bubble everything in. But yeah, great question. Um, I, I would really hate for you to um, miss points because they weren't bubbled. So then there's a few strategies you can employ. Of course, you can always just do straightforward math. You know, when you're tackling a, a functions problem, you're most likely just going to solve. And so depending on your level and comfort with math, you might do straightforward math for every single problem. That's totally fine. Um, that's, of course, one great way to do it. These strategies are in case you are struggling with a certain question, or you can even use them to double check your work to make sure that you did it properly. OK, so um, so just know that as I go through these strategies, I know there's more than one way to solve the problem. No, you do not need to show your work. So that's that's my step here. I said write down your work, but you don't have to show your steps. You don't get points for showing all your steps, but you should take notes in your work so that you yourself can follow what you're doing. Um, if you leave your entire test book blank and you do all the math in your head, it's really hard to go back and check your work. And you might make a, a simple mistake that you could have avoided if you just written it down. So um, hopefully the difference between those two things makes sense. So the first uh, strategy we're going to talk about is just drawing on graphs and figures. As you can see, if you're reading through, um, like I said, if you're reading through a short word problem, uh, we've got John runs at different speeds as part of his training program. This graph, so, you know, it's just that first sentence is explaining what you're looking at. This graph shows his target heart rate at different times during his workout. More explanation. On which interval is the target heart rate strictly increasing and then strictly decreasing? Okay, cool. So, um, so the most important thing is to put a box around the strictly increasing, then strictly decreasing. And then you could either draw on the side if you want to um, think about, okay, what does it mean to increase then decrease okay what is that going to look like you can then take a look at your answer choices and draw some lines on your your chart there or graph and um determine which one is matching what it is you you've already kind of indicated so in the case of this one uh b best demonstrates the strictly increasing, the strictly decreasing. When we talk about signposting word problems, I'm going to demonstrate what that looks like a little bit more on this problem, and then we'll solve this problem in a moment. And again, these are all problems that you would have encountered on practice test one, so these should look familiar. On Saturday afternoon, Armand sent M text messages each hour for five hours. So, you know, the irrelevant information is that it's Saturday. Doesn't really matter. The relevant information is that there's an M number of text messages each hour for five hours, right? Like we've set up a rate of him sending text messages. And then Tyrone sent P text messages each hour for four hours. Okay, so. Again, a rate of a certain number of text messages for a certain number of hours. Which of the following represents the total number of messages sent by Armand and Tyrone on a Saturday afternoon? Now, if you just tried to mental math this out and create a um, and create a formula, for some folks that can be a little bit challenging and feel a little bit too um, 
it's, it's not specific enough, right? And so if you're somebody who needs something more concrete and less abstract, this is when, um, this is when something like uh, picking numbers is gonna come in handy, which we'll talk about in a moment. But for now, we're looking at the signposting. So I, I did it in different colors. Like I said, on actual test day, you won't have different colors, just your pencil doing that for you so you can just see what we're looking at eat more easily. So we've underlined the important information and then total number of messages is the most important piece of information and that is our target. Picking number, okay. Oh, there's a couple of questions. What's What if it's faster to do and check in your head? Daniel, I would highly recommend that you write some things down on your page. And maybe if you got an 800 on Monday when you took the math test, then I have nothing to tell you. <laughs> but if you got some problems wrong, um, I would suggest that if you had written more things down to be able to check your work, it might have allowed you to catch your incorrect answer choice a little bit easier. Um, so that would be the thing that I would I know in some problems, if you can do it through your calculator um, and that's how you got your answer, then, you know, maybe that's that's it. Maybe you don't write anything down. But if you're getting through the section really fast, there's no there's no drawback to taking a few notes as you go just to make sure that you're you're doing as well as you can. Can I do the question in the test itself or on a different sheet of paper? So usually you're not given extra scratch paper. Um, typically all your work has to be done in your booklet so that that can be easily collected at the end of the test um, so that students aren't leaving with extra pieces of paper with notes on them. Yeah, just as Andre said, writing things down eliminates your mistakes as your brain can get clustered with information. Again, particularly because math is at the end. You've been testing for three hours. Your brain is getting tired. You need to let, give your brain just a little bit of a break um, by writing some things down and, and not making it carry such a heavy load. Okay, so picking numbers. Basically, uh, like in the problem we just saw, and I'm going to bring it up again, if there are variables in the answer choices, as there was, you can pick numbers. And so basically what you're doing is just like an equation is going to be relevant no matter what number you pick. And so all you're doing is creating something that's something that was abstract and you're making it concrete. So we're gonna give a certain number of text messages to each person, right? And that number could be zero, it could be one, it could be two, it could be 745. Now, is 745 a practical number to choose? Not so much, right? We want to pick numbers that are easy to work with. Um, two, five, 10, 10 is super easy to work with. Uh, zero and one can also be really easy to work with. You just have to make sure that if you choose a zero or a one, that it's fitting within the parameters of the problem that's being given to you. But these numbers can help us. Zero is like super easy to multiply. You know, once you multiply with a zero, it gets rid of everything. And, um, and sometimes that can really help us uh, get rid of some wrong answer choices. Negative numbers, when are they appropriate? Um, obviously, when when a problem calls for uh, negative numbers as part of the possibilities. When we're dealing with text messages, you can't send negative text messages, right? So that, would, you, that wouldn't work within the parameters of the problem we just looked at. So you have to make, you have to pick numbers that work within the restrictions you have in the word problem. But remember that, oh, you know, if this problem also includes negative numbers, I should probably test with them as well, because it might come up with some uh, different kinds of properties than just positive numbers. And then, of course, when you're working with percentages, choosing 100 is a, always makes sense um, as a great number to work with, usually um, a, usually a really good one to, to help uh, streamline your math. So now... Let's go back to the problem at hand with both Armand and Tyrone. So in this particular problem, we can say, um, let's pick two and five, okay? I guess Armand and Tyrone are, are, they're boomers. They don't text message that often. 
So they're only sending two messages an hour for five hours and five messages an hour for four hours respectively. Okay, so Armand's gonna be our two and Tyrone's gonna be our five. Does it matter? No, you could switch it. You know, Ar Armand could be five, Tyrone could be two. Um, Tyrone could be one. Uh, you can pick whatever numbers you want. The point is that you need to then, as you're plugging them through the problems, be consistent, right? So if we decided M equals two, then when we put it into each of A, B, C, D, M is gonna equal two. We decided P is gonna be five, same thing, right? So these are the values that we decided on. You can pick anything you want, like I said. So then you have to just figure out through the logic of the problem itself. This is this is when you're kind of realizing the sort of math that you'll be using, right? So when you're doing a rate, M text messages per hour, then you're multiplying, right? So for two messages every five hours, that would then equal 10. And five messages per every four hours, that is going to equal 20. Now let's go back to our box of what is it we're actually looking for? total number of messages of both people. So what that's gonna look like is 30, right? 10 plus 20 equals 30 messages. So now we've got this number 30. Okay, now what are we supposed to do with that? Well, if we put these numbers through each A, B, C, D and do the math, whichever one equals 30 is going to be your right answer. So um, so when we do that, when we go ahead and put each number through, um, so again, what I mean by putting it through is that M equals two and P equals five. So in the case of C, when you put in M equals two and P equals five, and hopefully right as you're doing it, you could see, oh, that's the same way I set up kind of my own problem as I was working through it. And that one of course equals 30. Um, so again, for some of you, if you're really good at algebra, if you're comfortable with variables, you are maybe able to do this without picking any numbers. But if, if you're a person where this felt uncomfortable, this is a really great way to make the problem a little bit easier to work with. Um, and like I said, if you're dealing with a higher difficulty problem, this still works. And if you're if you're wanting to double check that you did your math right, this is a picking numbers is another great way to do that. Um, the great thing about a, a, a multiple choice test is there's only four right answers. So, um, so it will take you a little more time to do this, but again, that's going to be, hopefully, if it's a higher difficulty problem, you've saved a little bit of time on something else where you can spend that uh, to just double check your work. So that's what uh, that's what the picking numbers looks like. Now we're going to talk about solving backwards, which is the the good friend of the picking numbers. So this one works when there's numbers in the answer choices. Basically, there's four answers that could be right. They're all there on the page, and what you're doing is you're taking them, you're putting them through the problem that's been given to you, and um, and seeing which one is right. So. Um, this also can be useful for double checking your work if you've solved something through straightforward math and you're just double checking, kind of going backwards. Especially if one of your answers is not on there and you're like, ooh, how did I mess, you know, what, what mistake did I make? And so this is another way to kind of flip things for you and, and help you look at the problem in a different way. So what does that look like? Now, this particular problem is one that you actually have to solve backwards on. It's in the instructions, which of the following numbers is not a solution. So it's saying you need to use these four numbers to solve this problem. So this is actually the, <laughs> the way to solve this problem. But you can use this technique in, in any kind of problem uh, that's set up in this similar kind of way. So it's really important in this one to remember what you're targeting, which is which of the following numbers is not a solution, okay? So um, so that can sometimes be hard because now we're looking, It's you've got to switch your brain off of like, okay, I solved it, it worked, wait, was that right or was that wrong? So um, what you can do is kind of work your way through, and I know that I used, um, I was using PowerPoint when I made this, so the math symbols are not the cutest, um, but you can see what I was trying to do there. 
So um, as you plug in uh, negative one through this uh, problem, you can find that the solution is uh, negative eight is greater than or less than negative seven. Okay, is that true? Um, that is not a solution, right? Okay, cool. We are trying to find not a solution. This is not a solution, matchy matchy. Um, you can go ahead and stop there if you feel real happy and comfortable about it. Um, but if you're kind of feeling skeptical and you just wanna double check, check you're doing things right, you can always double check your other solutions. Um, and as you keep going, you would find that negative two um, is, well, negative 11 is greater than or equal to negative, it's equal to, right? So that is a solution. Solution, not a solution, not a match. So again, just writing things down can sometimes help your brain go, not a solution, not a solution, match. That's what we're looking for, putting the box around it, double checking. Um, and then if you if you were to keep moving, you would see that we're moving farther and farther away and things become, you know, as a solution, now it's greater than we can imagine um, negative five is also going to be uh, much greater than. So this one is, is A, not a solution, not a solution. Uh, McKenna, if you would put your question in the q and I'm going to address that. I'll, I'll work with that later since it's not related to what we're talking about right now. Or actually, you know what, I'll bump, I'll bump it over there to Q&A. We'll talk about, we can talk about NCAA stuff later. Using log logic. Okay, so there's a lot of questions where you can actually kind of just use your understanding of the world in order to cross out answer choices that can straight up not be logically true. So um, if you're dealing with a figure, um, you know, certain figure measurements can't be true. Um, if you're dealing with graphing, you know, certain kinds of graphs aren't going to, are going to make sense based on the information given. Uh, negative and positive numbers, right? Like if you're dealing with something, uh, I don't know, if you're dealing with a, a, a quantity, let's take the text messages, right? If you're dealing with a quantity of text messages, you can't have negative text messages. So there's going to be certain, thing, certain things that you can, um, that you can figure out logically. Um, as always, draw on your figures and graphs to, to help you with that. And you can use logic to save time, as well as help you make educated guesses when you're unsure of the answer. So, um, so rely on your logic. If you encounter a question where you don't know how to tackle it, you can use logic to help you cross, maybe cross out a couple answer choices to make a more educated guess, right? Because we always want to guess even if we don't know the answer. Yeah, so Roberto's asking, isn't the back solving technique time consuming? Yeah, it could be a little bit more time consuming than doing a straightforward math. That's why it's a tool to add to your tool belt as something that you could use. Um, I would say for the most part, it's a good idea to try straightforward math first, but not everybody's comfortable with the kinds of math that's being asked of them and might find that the back solving is more efficient for them if they're not sure how to tackle a problem in the straightforward way. So yeah, I want you to think of it more as different tools you can deploy depending on the problem, depending on your comfort level with the material. I would say I'm showing you lower difficulty problems where you're gonna think, well, I would have gotten that without using this. Well, that's fine. I'm I'm using easy, like uh, lower difficulty problems just to help illustrate it a little bit more clear. So that's going to be this one right here. See, it's a number three. It's a bit of a lower difficulty problem. But I'm going to show you for this one. This is a time saver. You can use logic on this one to actually solve this problem very, very, very quickly. So in the figure above, uh, lines L and M are parallel, and lines S and T are parallel. So you don't really need to do anything with that information. It's just confirming that the figures to scale and that those are indeed parallel lines. So like when you're going through this kind of information, you're just going, okay, com confirmed, right? If the measure of angle one is 35, what is the measure of angle two? So when we look at angle number two, what do we know about this angle? Is it acute or obtuse? And then when we look at the answer choices, logically, 
without doing any math at all, logically, which answer choices can we get rid of? Yeah, it's an obtuse angle. We know that. We've been told that this figure is to scale. So that is true. Now, when we look at our answer choices, how many choices do we actually have? You know, what are we looking at here? How many can we cross off? Yeah, A, B, and C. A, B, and C are all acute angles. And D is the only answer choice that could possibly be right. So sometimes when using logic, you can actually get to an answer very, very quickly. And you can trust it because the question told you, you know, the parameters at the beginning said figures to scale are to scale. In this, in this language, it said these are parallel. This is to scale. We didn't even have to do any math. Not that the math on this one was incredibly difficult, but you just shaved off seconds by identifying obtuse angle, look at my choices, done, move on. Yeah, there was one choice and you solve that. You can solve this in three seconds and then you get to save all that other time for a higher difficulty question. When it comes to grid ends, there's a lot of um, parameters. So it's important to understand them so you're not wasting time reading these rules, of course. Um, so. When it comes to grid ends, uh, I'll read through these and I'll, I'll answer any questions that you might have. Uh, although not required, it's suggested you write your answer in the boxes at the top. Uh, if the columns to help you fill out the circles accurately, you will only receive credit for the circles being filled in accurately. So, so yes, it's a good idea to write in the answer choices. That's not mo the most important part. If you're running low on time, bubble. <laughs> bubble <laughs> don't waste time writing down the numbers um but you know if you have time it's good to write them down to make sure that you're bubbling correctly mark no more than one circle in any column that's pretty logical no question has a negative answer that's another parameter to realize that when you're dealing with these problems these grid in problems there are no negative answers so if you're solving and you're starting to get a negative answer then you need to reassess how you're tackling the problem and go this is not going to be right there's no way i can even grid this in um, so that gives you a bit of a boundary to work within some problems have more than one correct answer. In some cases, grid in one answer. Yeah, so sometimes you'll get a range and like the answer might be anything between five and seven. So you can say six, but you could also say 6.25 if you're feeling really cheeky. Um, so you can, you know, you can have fun with it if you want to. Mixed numbers such as three and a half must be gridded as 3.5 or seven over two, right? So if you were to put in three, one, uh, then the dash and the two, what you would have is 31 over two, and that would be an incorrect answer. So you do need to make sure that you do that properly. And then with decimal answers, um, as it's showing here, there are multiple acceptable ways. So like two thirds is also correct as 0.666 and 0.667. So your final number doesn't necessarily need to be rounded if it says or truncated. It must fill out the entire grid though. Okay, so like 0.6 would not be right, but 0.666 is. The other, uh, the last thing is you can justify to the left or the right, and the word justify means lining up. So you can start your answers and go left to right, or you can put them to the right. Um, either one will be correct. So let's grab one of the grid in questions from practice test one. Number of portable media players sold worldwide each year from 2006 to 2011. I love how this is a very like dated question about a very specific period of time. Um, at this point, maybe you're not even old enough to have seen um, an iPod. <laughs> Uh, according to the line graph above, the number of portable media players sold in 2008 is what fraction of the number sold in 2011? And I think part of including portable media players is to almost throw a student off as to be like, well, what is that exactly? Is it a phone? Is it a this? Is it that? Who cares? It doesn't matter, right? Um, what matters is the, just the math involved. So basically, it's just asking you to make a fraction, 2008 compared to 2011. And when it comes to creating a grid in, so, you know, 2008 versus 2011 would be 100 over 160. 
that number is too big to grid in, right? So you have to reduce the fraction in order to grid it in. So what would be the reduced fraction? You can put it in the chat. What would be the reduced fraction that you would be able to grid in here? Exactly, five eighths, five eighths, five eighths. Excellent work, yeah. So of course it is five eighths. So even if you were to reduce it to something like 10 over 16, that would also still be too high to, um, to be able to accurately grid it in. And just, you know, the other thing you could do is you could put 100 over 160 into your calculator and the decimal that comes up, you can put that in, that would also be correct, right? So that would be a fast way to solve the problem and would still give you the right answer. Okay, so now we're gonna we're gonna launch into some practice. The first thing we're gonna talk about is just different methods we can use to solve the problem. So I, I want you in the chat to tell me what kinds of methodologies we can use, um, and then I'll let you solve on your own and put up a poll. So for this question, a book was on sale for forty percent off its original price. If the sale price of the book was eighteen dollars, what was the original price of the book? Assume there's no sales tax. Okay. We're in Oregon, apparently. Is there any Canadian provinces without sales tax? Maybe. In the US, Oregon is known for not having sales tax. Um, okay, so you know, when it comes to word problems, you'll see I, I kind of like creating a little story. It really helps. You know, I see I see the sticker, I see the 40% off sticker, I see the book for $18. I think how excited I am because it's on reduced price. Um, because it used to be more, right? So knowing that the book used to cost more and that our box that we're putting around the answer is what is the original price, logically, which answer choices cannot be true? So before we do any math, let's just cross off the answer choices that are completely false. We're looking for the original price of the book, which must be more than $18. Yeah. A and B, right? A and B can't work. I'm, I'm not sure why people are saying D. So um, again, we're just doing the logic, the logic of, of that if something's on sale, its original price had to be more. A and, yeah, A and B cannot be true since they are less than the discounted price. Okay, so just using logic, A and B can be knocked off the whole shibuddle here. Now, these answers are impossible. So we're down to only C and D at this point. What's another method that could be used here, again, you can use straightforward math. If you if you know how to tackle this straight, on the straightforward math, that's fine. But if you're like, oh, it would really help me to just choose the number to start with and then take the 40% off of that to see if it gets to 18, I, that's gonna work better for me. So um, what do we call that? What method is that? Back solving, exactly. So this would be this would be solving backwards, right? So we can solve backwards, which means taking the numbers that are in the answer choices. So taking 30, taking 45, uh, applying a 40% discount to it and seeing which one hits 18. So having said that, I'm gonna open the poll and you can solve and uh, let me know which one you've picked.
All right, so we've got some really great, got some answers coming through here. There's still quite a few people who, uh, who are, you know, it's, it's still more split than I expected. Um, I did notice how people were a lot using some logic for D, and I think that was, I think that's great. Um, Golson says D is more than twice the sale price, but the sale is only forty dollars, right? So you used your logic on that one to actually get rid of D as well. So a few of you said D, and then you told me why you picked it. So Daniel had said D um, as well as Evan. So a few of you had noticed that it was logically impossible for D to work. And if you do solve backwards, um, that's what that can look like. Um, so those of you who took 45 and simply um, and simply multiplied by uh, 0.4 and got 18, you fell into a trap. Um, it's not how much was the discount uh, of the book, right? It, it was, it's how much the 18 is the sales price of the book. So again, you've got to keep track of the information along the way. And most of these answers, even the 720 and the 1080, um, there's probably some weird mathematical <laughs> holes you can drop into to get those exact answers and that's why they're there. Um, and then you've got uh, some folks in the chat letting you know how they solve the problem. The answer for that one was C. All right, so for this particular problem, um, again, let's talk about what methods we can use here. A helicopter initially hovering 40 feet above the ground begins to gain altitude at a rate of 21 feet per second. So I suggest drawing, right? Draw a little helicopter, it doesn't have to be very detailed, it could be a circle. Uh, draw whatever it is that's gonna be a helicopter for you. Draw the ground, make it 40 feet. It begins to gain altitude at a rate of 21 feet per second. Okay, so again, it's nice to have a little visual so that you know what you're dealing with and you know that you're using the correct logic and the correct uh, math as you're working through the problem. Which of the following functions represents the helicopter's altitude above the ground, Y in feet, T seconds after the helicopter begins to gain altitude? Okay. So the first method we can use is logic. There's a couple of answer choices here that can very clearly be crossed off um, because of, of it being completely illogical or because maybe it's missing a variable. Uh, this is a problem number one. So again, I know this is not a super high difficulty problem. So the important information you can see here, I've got underlines under 40 feet above the ground, 21 feet per second, and then the information about the variables. So with logic, I'm curious which ones are very clear to cross off. What do you think? Before you start, don't do any math, like before you do any math, just look at the answer choices and see, like there's no way it can be this one and why. I think people are doing math instead of responding to me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so Golson, thank you. A, because it isn't even, there's no T. Where's the T? <laughs> Right, so we can get rid of we can get rid of a because um, it's it's completely missing a variable, and you can definitely get rid of c because because c is a negative function and it would have the 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 helicopter just like plummeting into the ground, right? So that doesn't make any sense at all. Now we're left with b and d. B and D are basically using the same numbers. It's just whether you're putting the variable in the correct place, right? So on B, we've got 21T and on D, we've got 40T. And so that's just about, you know, reading the problem and making sure that you're creating the correct um, equation. But if you have a hard time with that, you can do what? 
pick numbers, right? So we can pick numbers and put them through just to double check which one is the right choice. So here's my beautiful drawing. You can see there's a very grassy ground and that at t equals zero, uh, t is gonna be your seconds as represented in the question, t is zero, and, uh, and then the helicopter is hovering at zero. So that 40, uh, is so zero and 40 and then we've got our t at one second you can get a sense of okay if i put one through the equation my output my y in feet it's going to be 61 right so again it's for some of you you might not have needed to do this but for some of you this might be incredibly helpful so this is what picking numbers is about is now you can use something like zero or one and put it through the problem and determine what has the correct output, the correct answer. So you can start with zero. So your t is going to be zero. And what should your y equal? Since it hasn't gone anywhere, your y should equal 40, right? So I'll let you, uh, I'll go ahead and open the poll again, and you can put in what answer choice you chose. All right, great job, everyone. Yeah, so this one, uh, so if you plug the problems through, uh, uh, plug the numbers through, I mean, and you put in your zero for t, and you solve the problem, you would get 40 as your y, which is what we were looking for, and that is correct. Great work. Now, let's uh, finish off with a data set problem, okay? Is there anybody who sees something like this where there's like, a lot of information and it automatically starts to feel nervous about it like does this freak anybody out um, because there's a lot of different bars there's multiple colonies there's a lot of information below to describe this uh this figure just curious how people feel about this yeah, it can be time consuming, that's for sure. Um, you know that when you have to read this much information, it will take a little bit more time. Agreed. So yeah, graphs can feel overwhelming just because there's a lot of information, right? And you don't know what information is going to be relevant. So you really have to balance your time here between understanding what's happening in the graph and you know, you don't want to take so much time that you're trying to get every little detail, but you also need to take a little time to make sure you understand what's happening, because if you get the logic of what's going on, you can go much faster through the questions, right? Um, so that's the goal here is to really just like try to get a good understanding of what you're dealing with. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, that it's that shit that, that it is pretty interesting some of the the topics and and I'm a little more of I like I like visual things so for me I like the data interpretation that's something I'm I'm attracted to a little bit more um, but I know that's not everybody's thing if you like this kind of stuff then you would also like the ACT science section because it's basically what ACT science is about is a lot of data interpretation. <clears throat> All right, so here we go. This is the insect count for three pesticide treatments. And um, you can see on the y-axis, we've got number of insects. And then on the x-axis, we got weeks after treatment. Okay, so you can already just glance at it and get a sense of what we're dealing with. Then we've got to read the block below here to really get it. Three colonies of insects were each treated with a different pesticide over an eight-week period to test the effectiveness of the three pesticides. Colonies A, B, and C were treated with pesticides A, B, and C, respectively. Now, for me, because I just, I just, I just did this one today. This is a new one I added. So for me, when I read this, the first thing I thought was, wait, is it three different kinds of insects and three different kinds of pesticide treatment? I took a moment right? And went, no, no, no. 
the insects is the same. So let's pick a bug just in your brain to make it a little bit easier. So let's say that there's spiders or maybe not a spider. Does that not count as an insect? Let's pick something different. Uh, a fly. Does that work for you? You can pick. I'll let you pick in the chat what you'd like it to be. So um, let's say it's something really gross or it could be something really gross like a cockroach. Okay, so let's say we've got colonies of cockroaches. And uh, so there's three separate ones. And now we've got three kinds of pesticides that we're testing to try to destroy the cockroaches. Okay, see, it can be a little bit more fun if you build a little bit of a story in and you, you know, make it specific to what's interesting to you. Here we go, next sentence. Each pesticide was applied every two weeks to one of the three colonies over the eight week period. Okay, that's pretty clear in the graph. We can see weeks after initial treatment. The bar graph above shows the insect counts for each of the three colonies, zero, two, four, six, and eight weeks after the initial treatment. Okay, that was that seems pretty clear. Now, now that I get all the information, I go back to the chart and I go, okay, so at zero, you know, we were somewhere, each colony was not that far from each other, 80 to 60 insects, cockroaches each. Week two, whatever pesticide they gave colony C basically created superbugs that are now trying to destroy the earth. Um, so I don't know what happened with, um, with, with colony C treatment C, but I'm, I'm scared of whatever that drug is. Whereas the other two, A and B, are kind of just like steadily going down, right? So hopefully as you looked at the graph, you noticed that, that you noticed the trends. Because it seems like obviously when you're dealing with a pesticide, the goal is to get rid of the bugs, have less of them. Okay, C doesn't seem that effective. Also quite scary. <laughs> Natural selection. See, you know, we've got like a little, like there's, there's like a, like the Spider-Man equivalent of a cockroach now. So let's go ahead and take a look at our answer, uh, at our questions. Question number 13, which of the following colonies showed a decrease in size every two weeks after the initial treatment with pesticide? So which ones? A, B, C. Now you can see there's Roman numerals one, two, three to refer to A, B, C. Luckily they did that logically, okay? Um, it would be very mean if they didn't, but you always need to double check that the Roman numeral one <laughs> means colony A and, and um, so on and so forth. Uh, I'll give you just another few moments to look at this and then I'll bring up a poll. All right, looking pretty good. Most people are getting this one right. Um, so just as we noted, you know, colony C shot up. So that's not a decrease, right? So that's the only one that did not decrease. So the answer for this one was C. Colony A and B did decrease every week, okay? So when it's asking if it decreased every week, it means in comparison to itself, right? So look at, num look at A. Did A decrease every week? Yes on you know, zero versus two, yep. You can see the color, the gray one, it goes down, 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 down. And then B, stripey, down, 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 down. And then colony C, superbugs, eventually starts to go down. So that one doesn't count. And there's one more problem uh, for this. You spent, so the good news is, you spent all the time reading and understanding. They're gonna give you two questions about it. So at least that's a benefit. Sometimes you'll even get three questions. So in the end, it kind of evens out your time since you already like invested in learning about pesticides and colonies. <clears throat> okay, so this one asks of the following, which is the closest to the ratio 
of, and then it's going to give you two different things that you're creating a ratio. Okay, so first part of the ratio, total number of insects in all the colonies in week eight. Ratio two, total number of insects at the time of initial treatment. Okay. So I'll give you a, I'll give you a few moments with this. I'll put up the poll. I'll give you like a total of 30 seconds or so to answer this one. So to answer this one properly, it's just really important that you keep double checking your underlined portions and what it is that you're working towards, right? Um, you're also just doing your best to like identify where those bar graphs are landing. So um, obviously if you had a pencil uh, and were able to mark this, it would make it even easier because next to each bar, what I would suggest doing is writing the number, right? So when you're over there in week eight, by colony A, you could write a 20. By colony B, you could write a 10. And by colony C, then a 50, probably. And then same thing with week zero. Once you do that and you've got all your numbers, you can add them up. And then once you have a ratio of 80 to 200, um, you can reduce that down to two to five. So good job for those of you who got that one right. For those of you who um, made a mistake on that one, just like double check the work that I put out here and see what was it that tripped you up? Was it the wording in the question? Was it a math error? Was it the fact that I didn't give you a ton of time to do it um, and you were maybe speeding through? So just whenever you make a mistake and have an error and get something wrong, use it as a learning moment. Like what about this? trip me up and how come I got this particular question incorrect? Just like you do on your practice tests. Great job on math. Um, now we're going to shift over to writing and language and um, basically run like a the house is on fire because I usually like to take a full hour. So I want to get you out on time. So the subscores for the writing section can be found in the top row. Um, and there's four different subscores that you will find there. The two main subscores um, are expression of ideas and standard English conventions, and they represent the full 44 questions that you will encounter on the writing and language section. So out of the 44 questions, 24 are expression of ideas questions, and 20 are standard English conventions questions. Within the expression of ideas category, you will always have eight words in context and eight command of evidence questions. The other eight will be some other form of reading comprehension, word choice, or sentence position questions. Expression of ideas is the category where you encounter some questions that feel the closest to reading comp questions. Um, we're making sure that you're choosing the right order, logical order of sentence structures, things like that. The standard English conventions questions are more related to grammar corrections. And those are gonna be things like subject verb agreement or punctuation. 
The writing and language section is always 35 minutes. And with the 44 questions, it's about 45 seconds per question. So it's a pretty fast section overall, um, but you don't have to have typically the same level of understanding as you do during the reading comp section. Here's your method that you're going to use for writing in language. It's a bit different than the reading comp method because your goals are different. You're going to read the passage quickly without note taking as you do in reading comp because a lot of the information is not, if you've passed it up and it's not underlined, it's not going to be tested on um, unless it, there's a detail that's related back uh, for a reading comp style question. Next, you're going to complete the questions uh, as you are reading the passage. So it's it's most beneficial to be solving as you go, as you're reading. When you get to an underlined portion, which is how this is so, you know, you've got the passage and you're reading it and then there's an underlined piece and that's where you're going to answer a question. So when you get to that underlined portion, this is when you start to do, your, your brain's gonna start turning. And you want to assess what part of speech, phrase, and or punctuation is underlined. So you want to just start identifying what's there. Is there a comma underlined? Um, is there a, what part of speech is underlined? Is it a whole sentence? Is it one word? And, and as you're looking at it, you're going to say, you're going to assess what are some common issues that this underlying portion deals with? So if it's a comma, we're dealing with punctuation. Is punctuation, is it used correctly? Um, you know, if it's one word that's underlined, is it the right word? Um, is it, are, am I being tested on vocabulary, like um, on if a certain word is used properly, effect versus affect, for example. So you can start to formulate a little bit of like, why is this underlined? What could possibly be the issue? Now, you're going to have an understanding of how to correct the issue before you look at the answers, but you're not going to do a full prediction as you do on reading comp, because what happens on the writing and language section is they might be testing like first of all if it's correct as written there's like not a lot of point in like dwelling on what could be tested especially if you're like oh well it's correct so move on but I'm going to check the answer choices just to you know just to make sure I know I'm right but there's also like oh I, I think that I'm being tested on this one thing and then you get to the answer choices and you realize it's it's something completely different so you you know, it's a little bit harder to predict. It's just a little bit better to um, understand what's there and be ready for what's to come, if that makes sense. Well, obviously we're gonna practice this. So we're gonna start with just some examples. These are from practice test one again. So when it comes to expression of ideas, one kind of um, question type you'll come across, one thing that's tested often is word choice and whether or not the right word is being used. So you can see in this particular question, one word is underlined. And so you can ask yourself as you're reading, what kind of word is this? You can also see that there's a comma underlined. So before you get to the answer choices, you're gonna you're going to say, well, I might be uh, tested on comma or punctuation usage here in some way. So I should just note that that's happening, right? So I'm asking you this question. What type of word is underlined? We were drawing circles around it yesterday. <laughs> what would we call this? This is something you, you will get tested on often in the, in the um, writing and language section. <clears throat> yes, Marina, ding, 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 Andre, you're correct. Transition word, right? Fabulous. Yes, you guys are nailing it. Good job. So um, you, this is a transition word. Whenever you see a transition word, you should identify what kind of transition word it is. Um, is it a contrast? Is it a, con a continuation? Is it a cause and effect, right? And you need to read the sentences around it and say, how are the sentences related to each other? Is this the proper connection between them? So in this case, it's a passage about Greek yogurt. Uh, so Greek yogurt is slightly lower in sugar and carbohydrates than conventional yogurt is. 
Also, because it's more concentrated, Greek yogurt contains slightly more protein per, ser per serving, thereby helping people stay, blah, 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 blah. Again, if you've got your test in front of you, you can see the rest of the passage there. But typically, just like the sentence before and the full sentence after is enough to, um, to answer this question, right? Because you just need to link the two together. So you're likely going to be asked, again, we're just kind of like, we're noticing a transition word. We're knowing that transition words, it's usually going to be something around, is it the right word? Um, so let's go ahead and reveal the choices to see. Well, first thing we can see is that the comma is in the same place for all the answer choices. So comma usage is, off, you know, that's, there's, that one's not being tested because it's the same in all of them. But we were right that what we're encountering is three other transition words, and we're determining if the continuation was the right choice, or as you were reading through, logically, there was something else, a cause and effect, uh, an example, or something like that that made more sense to you. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and throw a poll up here, and you can let me know what you thought. Okay, so for the most part, folks are getting this right, but quite a few um, picked C. So, you know, it's really important to, again, th consider the relationship of what's going on here. The first sentence is, Greek yogurt is slightly lower in sugar and carbohydrates. Therefore is a cause and effect word. So you would then be saying, therefore, Greek yogurt contains more protein. So you're saying there's some sort of relationship that 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 sugar and carbohydrates therefore makes it have more protein whereas also just means and also this other thing right like it has this and this as opposed to it has this and so therefore it also has more protein so that's not really kind of logically what's happening here this was a this was a straight up no change don't be afraid to to go with the a no change Here's another, another example of a words in context. So as you're reading and you just see one word underlined, it, the kind of the first reaction you should have is like, did this word sound right when I was reading it? Was it the right word in this sentence? Because it was. this is just like a verb that's underlined. Um, it could potentially be a subject verb agreement, um, but for the most part, it's gonna be a right word situation. So given these solutions, as well as the, the many health benefits of the food, the advantages of Greek yogurt outdo the potential drawbacks of its production. So again, kind of say it out loud <laughs> as much as you can. Obviously, when you're reading in a test, you can't speak out loud, but like try to give it sound in your ear and say like, was that the right word for this? So here are the answer choices. So Li Cheng, we, I went ahead and did a poll. So instead of putting it in the chat, yeah, there you go. Nice. She disappeared it. Well done. All right. Overwhelmingly, people are doing well on this one. The word, the correct word here is outweigh. So, you know, this is these kind of like choosing the right word situations have less to do with like studying a lot of vocabulary and instead understanding 
words that oftentimes get confused for one another. Like I mentioned before, like affect versus effect, um, those kinds of words that can sometimes um, that people get slipped up on. And those are the kinds of things that you want to be studying. You're more likely to be tested on that than like defining um, like defining a tough vocabulary word. That's not what happens here. Okay, this is the more challenging kind of question in the expression of ideas area. It's the um, command of evidence that's kind of most like what you do in reading comprehension. So this is where you have to have a better understanding of what's going on in the paragraph in order to best um, answer this particular question. So for question two, it's a which choice provides the most relevant detail, and there's a whole underlined portion there um, that's a detail. And basically when we reveal the choices, it's going to give you multiple other details that you might sub in instead. So in order to make sure you're choosing the right detail as you're reading the paragraph, it's really important to understand, okay, what is the main point of this paragraph? And also what's going on in the previous sentence that this is going to be a detail for? And I need to make sure that the detail is, is relevant to that, right? So um, this is something that you've read before. So I'm only going to give you like, um, I'm only going to give you a few moments to, to read it and to answer because um, I know that you already took this in the test. So I'll give you a few. Okay, so, so far I'm seeing a, um, the most answers are for B or D. And I think the most important thing here is, rem is to look at that sentence before, sen um, the sentence before where it says, to address the problem of disposal, farmers have found a number of uses for acid whey. So what it's making a statement that farmers have found ways to use acid whey. A number of ways, such as these examples. So what should follow is a number of examples of, of um, farmers using acid whey. And so for, for, for that, B is the most appropriate answer because it's giving you, besides feeding the livestock, you can also, the farmers are also converting it into gas and using it in electricity production. So it's giving you two of the solutions that they found. Unfortunately for D, um, it's it's just giving more information about about the cows, which is not which is not the most relevant detail to support the um, number of examples from the previous statement. Okay, so I know that those ones can be challenging, but good job. Moving forward, um, I'm actually going to, so for standard English dimensions, I'm just going to go through these really quickly so we can get to the, to get to more examples. Um, so standard English conventions are like any kind of grammatical errors. And so whenever you see something underlined like this, you're just, again, you're looking at what's underlined. Um, there's a comma, so it might be punctuation. There's a verb. Um, so maybe it's something to do with, is it the right tense? And then when we look at the choices, the commas in the right place, all of a sudden there's a possessive. So you need to decide if like changing, like you have to have noticed that it was missing the possessive when you were reading for that to be right. Like introducing the possessive, like, wait, was that necessary? No, right? And then um, 
you can also just make sure like was the subject verb agreement correct here as well. So this one was a this one was a no changer. And let's get to studying and practicing the common issues. So the good news about this section is there's just a very, very small number of grammar topics that are tested. So, you know, through using the Khan Academy, through your practice, you'll be able to start identifying those issues. Because as I'm saying it, like identify issues, you're probably like, how am I supposed to do that? Well, you're going to start to see that there's not that many things. And so you'll start to be able, like, this is the section I feel like is the one where people can gain the most ground the quickest. Because you know, if you didn't know you were being tested on pronoun usage and punch punctuation, and then you realize that's what the test is about, well, yeah, all of a sudden you can do way better on it because you know what you're supposed to be looking for. So um, subject verb, pronouns, uh, punctuation, particularly comma placement, parallel sentence structure, modifiers, commas, comparisons and lists, more commas. So you can see I'm bringing up commas a lot. Um, punctuation, placement, placement and commas is, is big. Um, idioms, much harder to study. An idiom is something that's just like the way that we say things or the way that we use um, like prepositions, like the fact that we get on a bus instead of in a bus, which doesn't make any sense, but that's just the way our language works. Um, so, you know, that's a little bit harder to learn if English is not your first language. That's just like kind of memorization. And then lastly, logical word usage and placement. More study tips. First and foremost, don't study vocabulary. Back in the day, there was a vocabulary section on the SAT. That has not existed since 2016. So if someone who took the test before 2016 is telling you to study vocabulary, you tell them, no, that is not on the test anymore. I do not have to do that. That is a waste of my time. Um, as we mentioned, the word choice situation is going to be very hard to just like study. It's studying hard vocab is not going to make you better at that. Become familiar with topics that are tested and practice identifying the issue. Understand the way issues can be addressed, but also be flexible. Um, choose the most clear, concise, and correct answer. The, this is like, hopefully this is the pro tip that's going to blow your mind right now. The right answer will never add more words unless they are grammatically needed. Wordiness is considered wrong on the SAT, okay? So the, the right answer will always be the most concise and to the point answer. Um, I looked through practice test one. I looked through all the answers in this section. There's not a single right answer in the, in the grammatical changes. Obviously, if you're doing like, you know, what's the most relevant detail, like length of those doesn't matter. But if you've got a, a grammar error underlined, there was not a single right answer that added more words. And the only time it usually works is when it's the ones where it's like combine these two sentences. And then usually you need to add like a combining word, an and or something. But typically the wrong answer choices are all longer than that. So even if you've added another word because it's asked you to, Oftentimes the shortest choice is the right choice. It's crazy. You could go and take the test, like just do this for fun. Take a section and just pick all the answer choices. I mean, obviously this doesn't work for A is always correct. So there's a bit of, you know, you have to still understand that. But if you go through and just like pick short, 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 short answer choices, you're gonna get tons of points for not doing any work. So, so hopefully that helps you. Like never choose a longer answer choice unless you have a really, 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 really good reason for it because it is probably wrong. Okay, so um, here's a few more examples um, when we're gonna we're gonna talk we're gonna focus on the comma placement piece again or punctuation because I saw these two and was like yes so much punctuation SAT loves punctuation. Um, so number 15, I'm going to ask you, so as you're scanning through number 15, what do you see underlined and what do you see as might come up as an issue? Again, don't give me, don't give me what's on the answer choices yet. Like just use 
use your understanding of like what's coming up for you as something that might be tested here. I hope, I hope you're still here. Okay, there's a comma that's underlined, yes. And then possibly may need another comma. Maybe a run on sentence. But remember, um, a BUI, you're only working on the part that's underlined, right? So maybe as you read the whole sentence, maybe you're not sure about that or not, but we're not being tested on the entire sentence for number 15. We're just being tested on that portion of the sentence, right? So we're being tested on the punctuation that might that's happening just in that section. Um, and so we're being tested on, we can see Jason Box, an associate professor of geology at Ohio State. This is a modifier of who is Jason Box, right? Anytime you can take out a piece of information and keep reading the sentence without it, then that's like, that's um, a, a piece of information that was modifying uh, the noun before, it, right? So Jason Box believes that another factor added to the early thaw. So everything in an associate professor of geology at Ohio State, as people are mentioning, should be locked in with a comma. Yeah, so all of you are identifying the issue, so you're doing a great job. I won't bring up a poll, I'll just go ahead and circle the right choice since you're knocking it out of the park. Um, yeah, so the answer for this one is C, where you simply add another comma because that is a, the modifier needs a comma at the beginning and the end of it. You will find that semicolons get uh, tested frequently because a lot of people don't know how to use them properly. Um, so it's really important to understand how is a comma used? How is a semicolon used? How is that different? How is a colon used? How are dashes used? And just understanding the differences between those punctuations because you, you will be tested on that quite a bit. Okay, so looking at number 16, I'm, I'm gonna bring up a poll for this one and you can just determine what is the correct punctuation and wording to use here. Okay, a few people are falling into the trap of choosing more words. So really what is being asked here is, should this be a semicolon or should this be a colon? And the answer is it needs to be changed to a simple colon. And if you chose that it needed to stay a semicolon, then you need to look up more information on what a semicolon does. Semicolons are very rarely the answer. They're often what I call punctuation flair. Um, you can use a period instead of a, a, a semicolon, so oftentimes they're not even really that useful. Um, so I think sometimes people think they're right just because they look, look fun, um, look like they're winking at you, but oftentimes they're the wrong answer. So let's pivot to practice. This is when the fun really begins. Okay, so now we're gonna use um, we're gonna use a passage from Practice Test 10. So this is one you have not seen before. This passage is the first passage, and it's how the cat and the hat changed children's education. In 1954, Life magazine article author John Hershey expressed concern that children in the United States were disengaged from learning how to read. 
Among other problems, Hershey noted, the reading material available to grade schoolers had a hard time competing with television, radio, and other media for children's attention. Okay, we've just got the word and underlined here. So now, what problems could we encounter? So again, the brain is turning, you're thinking, I see the word and right away, you know, what might come up as an issue? <laughs> Yeah, comma, exactly, Shatat. So we've got, we've got, uh, there's, there's a comma right before it. We've got what's called, what's called a list, right? So television, radio, and other media is a list of items. And whenever you, oh, you, is the comma underlined? So some of you are saying that it doesn't need a comma but the comma is not underlined. So you can't get rid of something that isn't underlined. It's an Oxford comma, and I think there's a lot of uh, dispute around that, but uh, in the case of the SAT, it's the Oxford comma is gonna be correct. Um, so we have a list, whenever you're dealing with a list, no problem, Daniel. Um, but whenever you're dealing with a list, you have to have parallel structure among the items in the list, right? Um, so, you know, right away when you see a list, you, you're thinking about that. You're thinking about commas. Also, it's what about the word and? What kind of word is it? Is it, is it used properly? We just have one word underlined, right? So you have to kind of think about what kind of word is it? It's a conjunction, exactly. And is it used properly? Well, we've created a list with the word and. Is that the proper way to use and? So those are the little, the, as your wheels turn, That's those are the things that you should be thinking of. You could even, you could jot those things down if you want to, but you, you don't need to, because like I said, you don't have to have a strong prediction. You just have to start understanding what you might get tested on. So could be parallel structure in a list, could be that transition word or conjunction, as you mentioned, could be comma usage potentially. Um, all right, I'm gonna reveal, give you a few seconds to look it over and then open the poll. Looking pretty good, looking pretty good. <clears throat> so hopefully you remember the advice that I just gave, which is you can see all these answer choices, all they're doing is adding more words. Did we need more words? Did we identify that we didn't have enough words? No, of course not, right? Um, this is the she I guess, exactly, absolutely. All the changes added unneeded words. This is always, always, always wrong. This is one of those. This is one of those great cases. As you're reading along, you look at it, you go, mm, "Everything's looking good to me for the most part. I can see what we're dealing with here." I look at my answer choices and I go, "Oh yeah, those are all bad." A, keep moving. Like this is one that you can rock through pretty quickly because of how poor those wrong answer choices are. Shortest answer, best answer, absolutely. Now, number two gets a whole lot more difficult because <laughs> now we're dealing with a command of evidence question. So um, we'll go ahead and read the question. Um, this is when you do want to start maybe marking your passage a little bit. Whenever you have a question that's similar to reading comp, you can employ your reading comprehension skills. So the writer wants to include a quotation by Hershey that supports the topic of the passage which choice best accomplishes this goal. So it's important to know what is the topic of the passage so that whatever choice we pick best represents that. So 
the title usually does a pretty good job of letting us know what the main topic of the passage is. The title, How a Cat in a Hat Changed Children's Education. Okay. And I would say also in the first sentence, the bit that, you know, basically he expressed concern that children in the U.S. were disengaged from learning how to read, right? So that is like, that's the topic is like, that it changed children's education and like what was the jumping off point for that was trying to solve disengagement from reading. So if we're looking for an example, as we read along, one solution he proposed was to make children's books more. Well, we need something that's going to say like, no, if, it, if he's saying it was disengaging, we need a quote that's going to be related to being engaging, right? The other thing is when you add in new sentences, you have to make sure there's no new grammar errors. However, even though I'm saying that, oftentimes in these command of evidence spaces, each one of them should be correct in grammar. Um, they're focusing more on the accuracy of the details rather than like, um, like adding a comma in the wrong spot. So, I mean, I'm, I'm indicating that, but at the same time saying like, for the most part, that's not the thing that's being addressed here. Um, in this particular kind of question. All right, so um, I will reveal the different answers and you can see this is also a no change. Sometimes these questions have all four are new. So that's the other thing you need to always double check whether or not A is a no change. Um, and in this case it is because there's already a quote in there. All right, so I'll go ahead and reveal that and give you about 30 seconds to answer this. It's almost a dead tie between A and D right now. So I'd like in the in the chat area, um, if you would like to say why you chose chose your choice, you can go ahead and defend your A or your D. C it introduces journalism, and and of course. That is really far off from what the um, what the paragraph so far has been discussing. That introduces something out of that's unrelated to the the subject at hand. And and, and B is is introducing failure, where where again we were trying to find how something is engaging. So it's maybe not the the best choice. So Arjun picked D because engaging children, you, illustrations could help engage children. It shows a way to make children's books more interesting, more engaging. Yeah, absolutely. This was, D was the answer to this one. So um, I know that these ones can be pretty challenging and because it involves command of evidence and having to find reasons um, throughout the passage of why that answer choice is the best choice. All right, let's keep moving along to number three and in the chat, yeah, oh dang, it's okay. It was a nice try. Uh, like I said, this is a harder, harder choice. And oh, so Li Chang, it says it's, this one is not the shortest answer. 
So remember what I said, when it comes to choosing a detail like this, this one's more about reading comprehension. So counting the number of words is not going to be the best strategy here. Um, it's, it's more about the concept. Um, the shortest answer answer stuff is, is going to be when you're correcting grammar mistakes. So the standard English conventions um, and, and word choice. Those are the ones where shortest is typically, you know, it's going to be the most right. Uh, for this one, for the detailing, counting all the words is not going to get you to the right answer. Okay, uh, number three. So, yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, so for number three, um, we, um, so that's, uh, that's also the caveat when I was talking about practice test number one and all of them, like not a single one adding more words. I mean specifically on the, the grammar corrections where that makes sense um, when it comes to adding a detail or something related to that. It's it's not about word count. It's about the um, the logic of the writing logic. OK, so the story of the Cat in the Hat publication began when William Spaulding, the director of the education division of the publishing company, Hufflin Mifflin, blah, 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 blah. What are some possible issues that so, again, what's underlined here? what could be a possible issue. Hopefully the first thing that jumps out to you is the punctuation, right? Just waiting to see in the chat for possible issues as you read and you're just identifying what's underlined there. Just like what, what do you see that's underlined? What could be tested here possibly? Yeah, hopefully the comma I see, yeah. The comma jumps out right away as like, okay, is it gonna be the right punctuation? for sure. Um, yeah, maybe something to do with comma placement. Um, you know, you've got a guy's name. That's pretty, I mean, there's probably not a lot going on there. And then the director of education. I mean, at this point, all I can really tell is like maybe something with the comma. Yeah, I think it has something to do with the comma. So let's go ahead and take a look at our answer choices. Um, and Here comes the poll. Ooh, a few people are swayed by the dash. Okay, so again, if you pick the dash because it looks fancy, just like pick, it's just like picking a, a semicolon because it looks fancy. Um, you've got to understand how dashes are used. Um, and for the most part, they're going to be wrong. They're usually kind of a grammar trap on the SAT. Um, Dashes can be used instead of commas, but they have there has to be two of them. So if you're creating a, a modifier and it starts with a dash, then it ends with a dash. So right now, if you put in a dash and it doesn't have a dash on the other side, you're introducing an error. So you have to have a really good reason for that. Um, so a lot of you got this one right. There was no error. Yeah, Simon is saying D could only work if the closing comma was also highlighted exactly, and that was also changed to a dash. But then at that point, you're changing two commas for two dashes. You're basically interchanging the grammar, so that would not really be uh, 
that wouldn't end up being a question on the SAT. They're not gonna, um, they're not gonna do that. <clears throat> no problem, it's okay if you click the wrong answer. Um, all right, and so as we continue reading, uh, so William Spaulding read Hershey's article and had an idea. Spaulding agreed that there was a need for appealing books for beginners. Oh, sorry, for beginning readers. He thought he knew who should write one. Okay, well, I don't know about you, but as I read that, I go, okay, those sound like two normal, full sentences with all the things that are needed to make sentences. And the thing that's underlined here is a period. Okay, so maybe we're going to deal with, um, maybe we're dealing with some sort of punctuation. Um, and then we go to the the question and it says, which choice most effectively combines the sentences at the underlying portion? Okay, so was it grammatically incorrect in the first place? No. Um, oftentimes when it gives you this, like, what would make the best combined sentence, it's saying like, these sentences were, were full okay sentences, but if we're gonna combine them, what would be best to do that? So there's a few things you've gotta do here. First of all, how are the sentences related? What kind of word am I gonna be adding in here in order to keep the same sense of the sentences? Now, don't spend too much time thinking about it. You might get to the answer choices and find that they give you the same word for all of it. So you don't need to, that's why we don't spend too much time making a prediction. You'll be going, oh, it could be a therefore, it could be a however, it could be an and, it could be, like you're trying to think of which one, you might get to the choices and go, well, that was time wasted, right? So instead, we're just getting a sense of what we might encounter, we might, um, you know, we might need to add in, this might be punctuation related, it might be related to the right word, okay? So having said that, let's go ahead and jump in to the choices. And the poll. Hopefully you're starting to identify a bit of a pattern here. <laughs> um, B introduces a dash, C introduces, introduces a semicolon, and D introduces way too many words, right? So usually the simplest, the most straightforward is the correct answer, and in the case for this one, the answer choice is definitely A. Um, it adds in a comma, it adds in an and, that's it, that's all. Simple, straightforward, grammatically correct. The answer is A. Okay, seven and eight are two of my favorite kinds of questions. And um, we are headed into the very final moments here. So I'm gonna let you do these on your own. And I'm gonna put up in a moment, a poll for each number seven and number eight, okay? So I'll give you about a minute or so to read it over and answer on your own. Right, I'm putting up the poll for number seven.
and watching question eight. So, Shatak, the cool thing about number seven, it's one of my favorites because there's a really, really, really great trick that goes with it. So I can't wait to share it with you if you found number seven tricky. So the um, part of the sentence at the beginning is a modifier. And the modifier has to modify the noun directly after it, okay? It's called, otherwise it's called a dangling modifier. So you need to ask yourself, that little piece before the comma. So like basically a modifier is anything that could be like deleted out of a sentence and it would still be a full sentence, right? So um, that little piece at the beginning, it says on the verge of giving up. And you have to say who or what is on the verge of giving up? Was it a story? Can a story give up? Was it an image or is it Geisel? Well, the person, Geisel, he's the one who was on the verge of giving up. I legitimately don't even have to read anymore. All I needed to read was the first word. C is the only one that has Geisel as the first word. Obviously, you read it all back through, blah, blah, blah. But this is the kind of question that you can get in a second just because you go, who wasn't on the verge of giving up? Geisel, that's the answer. Okay. And then number eight is another quick one, right? Um, we read, I'm sure you read that and you went, that's a lot of words for no reason. So let's go to the answer choices. Wow, there's one that's really short. Does it work? Absolutely. D was the right answer. The wordiness was most definitely the issue here. Great work today. Um, I am going to just spend uh, a moment talking about the essay, but since we're at time, if you don't want to hear about the essay, you can feel free to leave. I'll just spend like five minutes going over it. Um, I should very quickly pull up the information for tomorrow's session in case you didn't register for it yet. So give me one moment and I'll launch a poll in case you need that. Um, tomorrow is going to be a test, um, so I will, um, I'll send you the information, uh, send you the information about that, but basically, um, we're going to use the same link as before. I'm going to encourage people to use practice test three. Obviously, you can use, if you've done practice test three or whatever, you can use whatever test you want. Like I said, if you've got a test in a book, it's best that you can write. So if you can write in a test, choose that test. Um, so you can really start to use these techniques. The test will be just over three hours. Um, so be ready for that and try to do your best to have all those same, the materials that we talked about excuse me, number two pencil, the proper calculator, all the things that you would use on test day to try to, you know, use, use your skills that you've learned as best as possible. All right. Thank you so much for your work today. And like I said, I'll just spend five minutes talking about the essay. This is only relevant to those of you who signed up for it in May. Okay. So um, stick around if that's the case for you, or if you're just so curious. <laughs> Otherwise, have a great day and I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Oh, you know what? I'll put it in the handout section if that will help you. Um, hold on a second. I'll, I'll, I'm going to send an email as well, but I can throw it here in the in the chat, the one that I'm suggesting you use. So it's SAT practice test three. So here it is in the handout section. Yeah. Oh, it's uploading. Give it a second. And there it is. OK, so you can download it right from here. And I do suggest that you print it out if you can, or just have some way to mark your test, because that's going to be the best way to practice what we've done. Yes, the session recordings will continue to be available after this week. You absolutely can keep using them in the future. Okay, so the essay, <clears throat> 
The essay is 50 minutes long. It's always the last test. You get a two minute break beforehand. So you basically get to stretch and then start the essay. It costs 15 extra dollars and it's always an analysis. So you will be analyzing an argument from typically a notable person from history or maybe someone who wrote a um, compelling article of some kind. The essay will always have the following. It will be written, this is directly from the College Board website on how they describe the essay. It's written for a broad audience, so it won't be something, the stance won't be like very controversial or one-sided. Um, it will argue a point. It'll express subtle views on complex subjects. It will use logical reasoning and evidence to support claims. And that's important because that's what you're doing is identifying those things. It will examine ideas, debates, or trends in the arts and sciences, civics, culture, or political life. That's basically to say that it's there's a lot of different topics or areas it could come from. Um, and it's always taken from published works and all the information you need is in the passage. So this is another case where students think, oh my God, I'm going to read something about Benjamin Franklin. I never learned anything about U.S. history. I'm going to be disadvantaged. Um, everything you need will be in the passage, so you don't need to know anything additional about U.S. history or politics uh, in order to be able to answer the question. There will be two graders who give you um, one to four points in the following three categories. So between the two graders um, in each of the categories, you can get a minimum of six points and a maximum of 24 points. The reading category means, did you understand the passage? Do you understand the details and the evidence? So this is you as you're providing your analysis of what the author wrote, um, demonstrating that you actually understood what you read through the examples you use and the statements you make. Analysis, which is the kind of the higher level piece. Did you understand how the author built their argument using evidence, reasoning, persuasion, and claims for the passage? So the main thing that you're doing in this essay is just is analyzing and describing, did the author write a good argument? Yes. And why? How? How did they make a good argument? What are the rhetoric devices they use to make that argument? What are the examples? So the analysis part is the, the reading is the more basic level understanding. The analysis is like the higher level understanding of why the author chose to do these things. Kind of like function, right? And lastly, writing. Did you write a focused, organized, and precise essay with appropriate style and tone? So writing is like the actual mechanics of writing the essay. Um, writing a five paragraph essay, having an intro and a conclusion, your body paragraphs, having a point and having examples. This is what the uh, essay was for practice test one. It's about uh, Jimmy Carter and talking about the Arctic National um, Wildlife Refuge. And you'll always get this little piece of information that reminds you to take um, into consideration evidence, such as facts, examples, and examples to support claims, reasoning to develop ideas and connect claims and evidence, and stylistic or persuasive elements such as word choice or appeals to emotion. So the best place to learn more about the kinds of vocabulary you can use when you're describing and analyzing an essay, analyzing this argument, is actually the Khan Academy has a really great SAT essay gallery. And just going through the kinds of um, uh, the first three appeals to ethos, pathos, logos, for example, excellent um, excellent uh, ways to describe various arguments that might be used. Um, and so I'm not gonna go through all of these. Uh, so these are all just in that section of the Khan Academy, uh, including metaphorical language, data, anecdotes, etc. So I promised that would last five minutes. Uh, now, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take those. Otherwise you can uh, log off and thank you for your time today.